You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Useless information. Hi, I'm Steve Silverman, and you're listening to a classic episode of the Useless Information Podcast. For your listening pleasure, I present to you Conrad Canson's Shoes, which was first recorded and released back on February 11th of 2011. It's a wonderful story about a man who never saw much success while he was alive, but he continues to this day to have an impact on the lives of others. So let's take a listen. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast, my collection of fascinating true stories from the flip side of history. My name is Steve Silman. Today's story is titled Conrad Canson Shoes. But before we do that, let's start with today's question of the day. And for today's question of the day, I thought I would ask you about Hollywood's golden age. And the question is very simple. Who is the only person to have a star in all five categories of the Hollywood Walk of Fame? The five categories, if you don't know it, are one film, two television, three in the recording industry, four is radio, and of course, five is live theater. And here are your choices in alphabetical order. That way I don't favor one over the other. Was it one, Gene Autry, two, Bing Crosby, three, Doris Day, four, Bob Hope, or five, Roy Rogers? Again, which of these celebrities received a star on Hollywood's famed Walk of Fame in all five categories? Was it Gene Autry, Bing Crosby, Doris Day, Bob Hope, or Roy Rogers? Now, I'll give you some time to ponder over this question, and I'll let you know the answer to the question at the end of this podcast. And now for today's story on Conrad Canson's shoes. And I have to mention, now that I'm married, and I, I waited till I was 45 years of age to do so, uh, my wife and I were recently talking, and we decided we need to sit down and carefully plan out our estate, because we, we have different ideas of what we'd like to do with uh, the little bit of money that we have. And of course, being a teacher, I'm far from uh, you know being in the Bill Gates or Warren Buffett position of having to get rid of billions of dollars. I don't even have the millions or even close to it. And of course, not having kids, you know, I waited until I was 45 years of age. I have always had this crazy dream of doing something, you know, just outrageous, uh, you know, something that's insane and completely memorable with my money. Now, if you know the story of Charles Miller and the Toronto Baby Derby that I wrote in my uh, first book, Einstein's Refrigerator, and uh, other people know the story from other sources, uh, you probably know what I mean. But I have to tell you, as of yet, I have not figured out what that crazy idea would be. But one man that did accomplish what I would like to do was a guy named Conrad Canson, who's the subject of today's story. Now, Canson was not the kind of guy that history would normally remember. Um, you know, he was an actor back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, but he never ever found fame or fortune in any of the roles that came his way. His last performance was in November of 1938. That's when Canson played the role of the Spanish grandee uh, during a one-week run of the Broadway play Gloriana. That was appearing at the Little Theater, uh, which has since been renamed the Helen Hayes Theater. Now, he was considered to be a Shakespearean scholar, but his work was intermittent at best, and he never earned more than $60 per week, and that was even during the best of times. As a result, Conrad Canson led an incredibly frugal life. For example, while he was on the road, he limited himself to just one meal per day that could never exceed 25 cents in cost. And rather than pay for a hotel room while he was away from home, Conrad chose to sleep for free at local train stations and on park benches. And when he was back home, he would stop twice each week to pick up his mail at the Broadway office of Billboard magazine, which at that time was a theatrical trade paper, not the, uh, you know, the top ranking uh, music of the day. And while he was apparently penniless, Canson was always well dressed. He was typically in a well starched white shirt with a dark brown corduroy uh, pair of pants and a matching jacket. But what is most remembered about him was his high top shoes. You see, they were always polished perfection, and Canson bragged as to how far he could stretch a can of Kiwi shoe polish. And he was quoted as saying, an actor can't hold his head up if his heels are run down. That's the end of the quote. And soon the world will find out just how important a spiffy pair of shoes were 
to Conrad Kansen. You see, he entered St. Luke's Hospital in the summer of 1944 with $11.85 on his person. He died alone on June 28, 1945 at the age of 78 and was given a pauper's funeral that was paid for by the Actors Fund. After his death, his four-bedroom, sparsely furnished flat in Union City, New Jersey, was combed over thoroughly. The place was a wreck, and it's reported that his bed was just a pile of newspapers that was spread across the floor. Although I can't help but think that that was a bit of exaggeration on the uh, press's part to show, you know, the kind of squalor that he lived in. Nearly everything was thrown out, and a total of eight cents was found scattered around the apartment. What was most surprising is what the searchers found among the old newspapers, bottles, cans, and so on that had been strewn around the apartment. It was his handwritten will. And I think you may know where this is going. This was not just any ordinary will. It was one that revealed that somehow Conrad Kansen had amassed a small fortune over his lifetime. He had 18 different bank accounts that totaled up to over $100,000. And then there were other various investments that he made that added an additional $126,000 or so. In all, the man that lived like a pauper all of his life had somehow saved $226,608.34. Now, to put that into some sort of perspective, in today's dollars, that would be more than two and a half million bucks. His close friend Robert Campbell was interviewed by the press shortly after this discovery was made, and he revealed that he was one of the few people that was aware that Canson had accumulated a chunk of money. But even he was surprised as to how much it really was. Campbell said that Canson had studied the stock market for years, and he invested wisely. Now, he did take a great hit from the 1929 stock market crash, but Canson managed to make it all back plus, obviously, a lot more. His will stipulated that $5,000 was to go to the Actors Fund to cover the cost of his funeral. That made sense. Another $100 went to Billboard magazine for the free mail service it provided, and another $100 was to his good friend Robert Campbell. Now, the remainder was used to establish the Conrad Kansen Memorial Shoe Fund. And I bet you're saying, huh, what? The Conrad Kansen Memorial Shoe Fund and that was to be established at the Actors Fund. You see, the money was intended to provide free shoes for needy actors. And any actor that was down on his or her luck who was a member of the Actors' Equity was eligible for a free pair of shoes every year, and that was whether or not their dues were paid in full or not. His will explained the reason for this unusual gift, and this is a quote, Many times I've been on my uppers, and the thinner the soles of my shoes were, the less courage I had to face the manager in looking for a job. That's into the quote. Now, amazingly, the fund still exists and currently assists more than 1,000 people each year. The Actors Fund's 2008 annual report shows that $43,708 was spent to provide 1,133 actors with shoes. Only three criteria must be met to receive payment. First, you must be currently unemployed in the profession. That makes sense. Second, you must have your dues paid up in a performing arts union. And third, a year must have passed since your last application for the shoes. Now that's my kind of will. It's unusual in its requests, but one that keeps on giving and giving and giving even after the person has been long forgotten. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. And now for a few words from our retro sponsor. How often it happens, you meet a man, and you think, he's a nice fellow, but... But what? Well, you hate to say it, but it's that little breath of trouble. I mean, unpleasing breath. 
and the chances are this chap doesn't dream that a breath of trouble is tagging him, making him unpopular, hindering him in business, spoiling his fun. Without suspecting it, you may be the victim of unpleasing breath. So be on your guard against it. Just do this. Brush your teeth night and morning and before every date with Colgate Tooth Powder. For Colgate Tooth Powder cleans your breath as it cleans your teeth. Yes, scientific tests have definitely proved that in seven cases out of ten, Colgate Tooth Powder instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. What's more, no dentifrice at any price cleans your teeth more quickly and thoroughly than Colgate Tooth Powder. Remember to buy it first thing. And remember the name Colgate Tooth Powder with the accent on powder. Don't take a chance with your romance. Use Colgate Tooth Powder. That commercial's from the September 3rd, 1946 broadcast of the Mel Blanc Show. Uh, this particular episode was titled The Fix-It Shop for Sale. Now, if you're curious, tooth powder has been around since uh, ancient Egyptian and Roman times. Now, the ingredients have certainly changed, but all have contained some sort of uh, minor abrasive. Uh, over time, it's contained you know, finely ground bones, hooves, horns, and oyster shells, but the modern versions typically contain uh, baking soda and chalk. That's fairly difficult to find tooth powders today, and that's mainly because it's only used in poorer countries, in places where uh, you know fresh water is not readily available, and they probably don't have access to toothbrushes, so they use the tooth powder with their fingers. Now, if you don't know who Mel Blanc is, then I'm guessing you're fairly young. He was the voice of many of the most popular cartoon characters of all time. That includes Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Porky Pig, uh, Tweety Bird, Yosemite Sam, Woody Woodpecker, and go on and on, Bern Barney Rubble, and so on. Sadly, he passed away in 1989 at the age of 81 years. And now for a few totally useless yet totally true tidbits from history. It's time for what I like to call news of the weird past. And I figured with Valentine's Day right around the corner, that it would be good to pull out a few Valentine stories from the past. And our first little tidbit goes back to February 10th, 1908, where it's reported that the U.S. Postal Service has been inundated by the large number of Valentines being sent through the mail. The demand for one-cent stamps, that's about uh, 24 cents in today's dollars, had quadrupled in the days leading up to the celebration. Not only were cards and envelopes sent, but thousands of postcard-type Valentines were also being mailed. The steamers that were leaving for Europe were loaded with mailbags specially uh, being used for carrying valentines uh, overseas. And uh, they said that more valentines were going overseas that particular year than in any of the previous 10 years. And one notable card that they mentioned uh, being sent was a three-dimensional cutout of a window of a house. And when you look through the window, you saw real lace curtains and ribbon and then there was a pair of lovers that could be seen through the window. Our next tidbit is dated February 24th, 1944, which reported that Private Andrew DeStefano of Brooklyn, New York, received his Valentine 10 days late. Oh, bad news. Anyway, it seems that Andy had been mentioned in a newspaper article while he and his fellow troops were marching into battle near Rome, Italy. And then his girlfriend back home, his girlfriend Mary, read about it and decided to send him a valentine. So she asked the United Press reporter that wrote this article to deliver the valentine for her. So the reporter, James E. Roper, he knew that Andy was being pulled out of the lines on this particular day, and he took his Jeep to go pick him up. Now, Andy had no clue what was going on, so they drove back to a warm kitchen tent, and the reporter handed Andy a telegram, and that consisted of red letters on a white form, you know, in the Valentine spirit. Now, he looked awful. He was covered in mud and grime and, you know, real awful from, you know, fighting, but the message made all the difference, and here's what it said. This is a quote. I wish you were here to be my Valentine. I love you. I love you. I love you. Hope you will be home soon. Mary. Now, I have to be honest, I was really disappointed at this part because I thought this was going to be an Oprah or Ellen moment where Mary was just going to pop out and surprise him. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And our last little tidbit, which is my favorite of the three, occurred on February 14th, 1967, 
Well, it was reported that pretty Patsy Puckett, bit of a tongue twister there, uh, she was a student at the University of Mississippi, and she awoke to find her fancy sports car overflowing with red and pink balloons. Very romantic. There was also a note asking her out to dinner. So Patsy immediately knew who it was from. Uh, it was a guy that she had been dating, and she accepted the invitation. Now, I should mention that 20-year-old Patsy was the 1965 runner-up at the Miss America contest, so she was also Miss Mississippi. Now, several articles point out that she was an extremely attractive blonde and very shapely. Now, I doubt they would mention this today, but her measurements were reported to be 35, 23, 35 on a 5 foot 6 inch, 120 pound frame, and she did win the swimsuit portion of the Miss America contest. Now, the oddest part of this whole story is the sports car itself. It was a brand new Jaguar that had just been given to her anonymously the previous September. It just appeared one day out of the blue with the car title already registered in her name. Now, Patsy and her family and friends tried to figure out who purchased it for her. She actually wanted to try and return it, but they could never figure it out. So she decided to keep the car. Now, it's a good thing that she didn't pay anything for this particular car because her boyfriend, I assume that's the guy who gave her the invitation, a law student named Reginald Gray III, he totaled the Jaguar after dropping Patsy off from a date about a month and a half later. Um, now, I guess Patsy couldn't have been too upset with him because she married him on August 19th of that same year. And now the answer to today's question of the day. And I had asked you which celebrity received a star in all five categories on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And I gave you the choices of one, Gene Autry, two, Bing Crosby, three, Doris Day, four, Bob Hope, and five, Roy Rogers. So which one did you pick? I hope that you picked choice one, which was Gene Autry, because that is the answer. Now, oddly, uh, as I was typing this up, I asked the question to a friend uh, who was sitting nearby, and his reply to me was, who? And it really didn't surprise me. Most people today have no clue who Gene Autry is. He's basically forgotten. But I'm betting you know some of his classic Christmas songs. And it's almost impossible to say these without singing them. But I'll try to. First song was Here Comes Santa Claus, which he wrote. Uh, Frosty the Snowman, maybe you've heard of that one. And of course, his most famous song was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Now, briefly, uh, Gene Autry gained fame in the 1930s as a singing cowboy, uh, and he went on to make over 100 films and record an estimated 640 songs and sold over 100 million records. Uh, you probably also know his most famous non-Christmas song, which was Back in the Saddle Again. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's story on Conrad Canson and his shoe fund as well as our question of the day on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, listening to our retro sponsor Colgate Tooth Powder, and the news of the weird past Valentine's tidbits, which included the USPS being flooded with Valentine's in 1908, Andrew DeStefano's surprise telegram, although the girlfriend didn't show up, and of course, Patsy Puckett's Jaguar mystery. Uh, if you'd like to read more true stories just like these, please be sure to get a copy of one of my books. They are Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. Uh, both are written by me, Steve Silverman, and they're available from your local bookseller, online, and of course from your local library. If for some crazy reason you'd like to contact me, simply drop me an email at useless at steve.silverman.name. That's useless at steve.silverman.name. Or you can visit my website, which is uselessinformation.org. That's uselessinformation.org, and you will find inf uh, you know, links there to uh, contact me. As always, I'd appreciate it if you could log into iTunes and leave some positive comments to, you know, to help increase the number of listeners uh, to the podcast. People have done that. It's been great. Uh, lastly, I should mention that if you're interested, I did do an interview last week uh, for the Our List podcast. Uh, I called in over the phone so uh, my voice doesn't sound very good. Uh, the phone quality is not very good. But if you go to iTunes and search for our list, uh, the podcast and the interview will show up. The uh, length of it was about an hour. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, you can go check that out. I may at some point actually uh, put it out as a special podcast on mine since I do have the file. Um, but for now, you can just go uh, to their uh, link and uh, listen to it. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in the next time. Bye.